Bienvenidos, and welcome, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Nice. All right. I'm Jacob Kamontomsky. I'm a developer on the BLS Wallet Project. And here with me today is James Zaki, who is our uh, project lead. And we're going to talk about BLS Wallet. Anyways, what we're going to cover today, when the next slide pops up, is we're going to go over at a high level the team and project outcomes, a little bit on the basics and a high level overview of BLS signatures and aggregation. We're then going to cover um, where BLS Wallet is today with some examples and some of the features we have built in. And then we're going to cover where we're going next with the project. And finally, we should have ample time for questions. So we'll kind of go over the team and some project outcomes to start. This is our wonderful team. I'll move over here. Off of it. Off a little. That's OK. Um, we're scattered all across the globe. We're part of the Privacy and Scaling Explorations Group, which is a subgroup of the Ethereum Foundation. We work mainly with zero knowledge proofs and layer, uh, layer two scaling technology. Um, our goal is to bring more privacy and scalability to the Ethereum blockchain system. So kind of some of the outcomes we want to try to reach with our project, and the primary one, our North Star, or here in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Cross, is going to be reduce the, uh, the cost of L2 transactions, primarily by reducing the amount of data that is rolled up into L1s by reducing transaction size. Currently, with some initial numbers, uh, which are a little difficult to see right now, we've essentially simulated running 150 ERC-20 transfers, both regularly, normally on a rollup, as well as bundling them all together into a single L2 transaction using BLS Wallet, and we've gotten it down the transaction data size by about a quarter. Um, we're hoping that we can go even further than that. Uh, we still need to measure the impact that we're going to have on layer one gas costs to see how the transactions are actually going to be reduced. Um, but our team likes to limbo, and we want to see how low can we go with using some things involving address books, um, as well as some other indexing things to reduce that call data even lower than uh, where it's at. We'll get into um, how we reduce that size in a moment. So another outcome we're looking for is to be able to improve wallets. Um, one of the features with that is going to be account recovery. Sometimes people talk about a social recovery. So if your private keys are compromised, is there a way you can swap to a more secure set of private keys? And what kind of features, functionalities, and security that will enable? And then we also want to have upgradable functionality for wallets so you can change what features and things it has um, over time so that wallets can serve a more diverse set of users across the entire ecosystem. And finally, we want to make dApps a lot easier to use. And so um, part of that is by having a baked in multi-call um, or we call it multi-actions where you can take multiple transactions and put them into one. And then also having sponsored transactions where the user does not have to pay gas on their end and the dApp sponsors it instead. So that way, when users first come in to try a dApp for the first time, they don't have to go say to an exchange to buy Ethereum so they can pay gas for transactions. So to start off, we're going to uh, cover BLS signatures and aggregations at kind of a high level. Uh, BLS stands for Bon Lin Chacham. Uh, is a pairing cryptography based uh, signature scheme used in the Ethereum consensus layer, Zcash, and a number of other projects. It is um, deterministic for a given public key and message. Um, validators currently are using BLS uh, signatures, specifically on the BLS 12381 curve, uh, to uh, sign messages on the consensus layer. Um, and then inside of the EVM execution layer, we have access to the BN254 curve via EIP-197 that allows us to, um, which we use in BLS Wallet for both signing and then verifying on-chain the transactions. Uh, we're hoping in the future via a uh, newer EIP that we will be able to actually move to the Beacon Chain uh, curve for more security and for better access to frameworks that the Beacon Chain is using uh, to improve that signature. But the most important thing for us is signature aggregation. 
And what we're able to do with the BLS signature scheme is take multiple signatures, this work? Yeah. and merge them into one signature. So normally with the signature space you'd have taking up, we can shrink it into just one. Um, and this is really good for reducing uh, the data that we roll up into an L1, because normally when a roll up goes in, it takes all the transaction data as well as the signatures for each of those transactions, specifically the R, S, and V components of that signature. Instead, we can use one BLS signature across all of those transactions, plus one ECDSA signature, um, and save on that data that we roll up. And that's in the example we saw before why the actual um, transaction data payload is much smaller. Um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about the underlying oh, pairing cryptography, um, there's a really good visual guide at Cryptology, which will go into the actual aggregation and more about the actual BLS uh, signatures. So let's get into where we are today with BLS Wallet. So at a high level, as per most normal DApp usage, you're going to have a browser that's going to have a extension usually in the wallet, and that's going to be communicating to some RPC node. And we have the same setup in our example prototype extension. We're then going to, in our case though, have a set of user operations that we forward to an aggregator service, which is going to take many to separate operations and merge them all together into one and submit them to an L2 node, which then will execute against our uh, contracts for the verification of the signatures and then through the smart contract wallet. To dive into that a little bit more, um, at a high level, we're gonna have a DF starting out by generating the operations, which contain a set of actions, and we'll go into what that format looks like in a second. The wallet extension will then use the BLS client module to sign all of those with those BLS signatures. Those are then submitted into this aggregator service to create a single uh, a bundle of operations with one aggregated signature. Then the bundler will, aggregator will take that set of transactions and will submit them into the layer two EVM where we can do some work with expansion to expand the call data parameters into more uh, advanced or uh, more verbose data. We do the BLS signature verification across those and then finally, for each of those operations and actions, we submit it to the actual contract wallet, and uh, that is then executed against the actual underlying DF code. So the first feature we're gonna dive into is the multi-caller action um, for this. So uh, this is a library that our teammate Andrew helped uh, write. If you wanna try it out, you can npm install bls-wallets-clients. Still keep hitting that edge of that stage. Um, in there, we're gonna have a bundle that we're generating and the wallet's going to sign it. That operation is going to have a nonce, which is going to be the current wallet nonce. For if the wallet hasn't been created yet and it's gonna be lazily created, it'll just be zero. We then have an array of actions where those actions are atomic. So if any one of these actions were to fail, then they all would fail. Um, inside of that, you can specify an F value as part of that, the contract you're targeting, and then finally the encoded function that you'll send over. In the case of the example we have up here, um, we're doing an approve and a swap on a simulated DEX. And instead of it having to be two separate transactions, we can just merge it into one uh, via that format. Um, using, building on top of this, we've built a prototype uh, browser extension wallet called Quill. And, oops, too fast, cool. Called Quill uh, with Andrew and Katuk. And, oops, and as you can see here in an example, we have a standard transaction confirmation, which contains three actions inside of it, one of them in the middle being an approve. So instead of a user having to go in and separately run the transaction for approve and say transfer and something else, we can do it all in one and have just one confirmation dialogue pop up to them. Um, if you wanna learn more about how we have this set up and how you can integrate the DApp into it right now, um, you can find out more at the link below in our GitHub repo on how to integrate that in. So, Next, we'll get into sponsored transactions. So right now, the pattern we're using to have these sponsored transactions is to have our normal flow, but in the middle, we're injecting in this top center portion, the aggregator, an aggregator proxy, which essentially is taking those operations we would normally submit to an aggregator and is instead sending them to it where it qualifies to see if, they're, uh, if they can be funded uh, for free gas, basically. And so then that aggregator proxy will add that payment bundle in on uh, in there and then submit it to the normal aggregator, which requires a fee. 
and this allows for us to have those gasless transactions. Our teammate John has built a uh, very cool demo using uh, Scaffold F for the Scaffold F community, which is a single pool DEX. Um, and as you can see here, it's a just single pool DEX with a swap. Um, it does use the multi-action as well to do the approve and the swap inside of it. And then it all runs inside of the browser with no um, need for like upfront gas because the aggregator proxy is going to subsidize it. And so that allows for a free transaction. You can find out more at this, uh, the GitHub repo below, and it also is deployed at single pool dex react app .app. Um, We're also looking into doing this directly via a contract. Um, the way the aggregator currently works is when it receives a bundle, it's going to actually introspect and look at um, whether when it ex simulates executing that transaction, if it gets paid either in F or we also allow ERC20 tokens. If it sees that it happens, it will include it in the bundle it's going to submit to layer two. So one of the ways you can take advantage of this inside of a contract is just have it pay transaction origin, and then the aggregator will get paid. Um, you can also do things potentially like gate this payment via an allow list, ownership of an NFT, or potentially even something like a ZKP proof, so that you can only allow um, certain people to have access to that. Um, this also allows anyone potentially to be a bundler and submitter, potentially even MEV bots that are looking for profit, and be able to um, submit those in so that you don't have to go through a specific aggregator and you could submit to, say, just a general, say, bundle mempool going on top. Um, we still have more research to be done to figure this out, but we believe it should be uh, pretty feasible and possible to do. All right, and now I'm going to hand things over to my teammate, James. James? Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you've done pretty well, given uh, the slides have been a bit off and we've just lost our speaker notes, but okay. Uh, yep, so with recovery, um, it's kind of catastrophic with an EOA uh, if your private key is compromised. You're basically racing against an attacker to secure your assets. But with a smart contract wallet, we've implemented a recover function um, that requires basically setting a recovery hash. From that hash, yep, we've got the notes now behind the timer. Um, yeah, so with a recovery hash, it just consists of the address that you're going to trust to um, call the recovery function um, and the, the hash of the, wall, the wallet's public key that you're um, addressing and some salt so that, you, um, so that an attacker can't actually deduce your recovery um, address or the wallet that will call that. So when you do call recover, you pass in those parameters and you are the caller itself, then you can immediately reset your BLS key and uh, yes, basically stop um, the attacker who set uh, who may have attempted to um, take some of your assets or set some of the other functions. So if an attacker steals your key and tries to reset your key, they can't do that because there's a one week delay in setting that parameter. With your recovery, you can do that straight away. So as soon as you see a problem um, in that someone's trying to set something that you didn't, you can intercept it with this. We take advantage of um, the fact that when you first set your recovery hash, um, it will set it immediately, but otherwise it's a secure function, so it will have a delay. Um, and in doing that, you can do something quite um, fun with dApps, in that if you want to uh, onboard your users, um, you can put a, a wallet inside the browser and um, have them use that. You can send them some assets, like give them basically a Web2 usability experience, but you, they actually have Web3 assets in their uh, browser wallet. But then at some point they may say, um, they may wish to secure those as assets further. So you have the smart contract deployed, you have the key inside the browser, but that's not very secure. So you can do something like suggest to the user that they set the recovery hash of their browser wallet, and you can do that via the DAP. And then uh, from the secure wallet that you've prompted them to install, like if it's our prototype extension Quill, you can um, then recover uh, the wallet that was in the browser. And what you've done is effectively set the private key to the extension key rather than the one in the browser. So that one's lost and you've secured it. We find that's just a smooth way to onboard people. So where to next? So let's sort of start with uh, where we began. So we were looking um, primarily at aggregating signatures, obviously to reduce the call data um, towards layer one on rollups. And we wanted to, I don't have the slides here. So yeah, I wanted to leverage um, account abstraction, which was at the protocol layer first. So that was EIP 2938. Uh, with that, we realized there could be some delay for that. And also that seems to have um, paused since then. Um, so we decided at that time to focus on a BLS only signature scheme because that's what we needed and that would be a contract wallet. 
Uh, we did some preliminary optimizations like parameter deduplication. So if you have a bundle with a lot of common parameters, you can effectively, like factorization, you take it once out the front and fill in the gaps. So something like an airdrop is, is really valuable. So if someone wants to do an airdrop, they can send a bundle of transactions. They pass in one um, contract that they're interacting with. It's one sender. It's one address that's calling it. And then, um, yeah, some of the parameters are the same, except for the recipient. And in that case, you can effectively, yeah, de deduplicate parameters uh, there. I've got to ignore that screen. There we go. Uh, yeah, some of the wallet features we then focused on were, as Jake described, sponsored transactions, multi-action, recoverability, and upgradability. And then we heard about EIP 4337, started to gain some interest and popularity. Um, and at that time, our contracts were going for audit, so we're trying to figure out, do we just finish what we're doing or, or look at that? So then we decided to, yeah, look towards being compatible with 4337. So that's where we are now. Where to next? We still focusing on aggregating signatures for the lowest cost transactions on layer two. We um, will be focusing, oh, my slide's moving around. Yeah, still focusing on aggregating signatures, and then we are working on being 4.3.7 compatible. One of our colleagues is almost there with that. And I noticed, is that drawer in the background? Say hi. <laughs> uh, so he's working on 4.3.3.7. Um, well, what I should explain, yeah, 4.3.3.7 is doing account abstraction on-chain. So they've um, got an, basically a smart contract template for that and a structure for how that will work um, regarding paying gas as well. Uh, the way we originally did it, as Jake described, is putting in a reward to the TX origin so that MEV bots can um, process the transactions. But there's also the way using the alt mempool that 4.3.3.7 proposes. So we can do either of those depending on what the DAP wants. Um, further optimizations, um, the 4.3.3.7 user operation contains you know, more gas parameters to take care of uh, the way they do that. But for when we want to do it the direct payment way, we can, again, optimize those parameters out by not passing them in, having a preceding function that then populates them with zeros. And then from there, uh, we can do public key mapping. So we have um, yeah, smaller uh, data sent in for the larger addresses, uh, sorry, larger public keys, and also doing things like floating points. So if a bundle has a lot of variables that are actually within a specific range, we don't need to pass in a UN256 bit um, uh, number for each of them. We can actually have some um, smaller range for those. So saving bytes wherever we can. There's a lot of things we want to do there. Um, some of the, just almost like, a, say, a refactor phase, we want to um, bring some of the stuff we have in our current wallet basically into modules, so we may consider using SAFE for that um, and some of the examples um, in 4337. Uh, and then we will um, inherently benefit from 4844, which is, um, yeah, towards dank sharding. So when we take a step back, what we're doing is lowering the transaction costs on layer two. And when you do that, it increases the number of viable applications that can be built or viable solutions um, that can be put out there to solve problems. And I like to sort of visualize it like this. On the, um, the x-axis, we've got transaction costs. And we have a lot of DeFi things going on. And that works on layer one, even if it's a, um, a, you know, during a busy time and there's uh, you know, high gas costs. A high value asset transfer is worth it. You will pay $100 a transaction to move something of significant value. Um, similar, if you're, there's a hyped up NFT drop, people will spend the gas to do it. But that's not everyone. That's, a, that's kind of, I would say, a very small um, set of the of population. Um, with rollups, you can get cheaper transactions towards tens of cents um, or less. And then you can, casual gaming, it, it warrants that. You can spend tens of cents for a certain type of interaction, and, and that works there. But what we want to do is go towards this. We, with EVM uh, rollups, um, adding the BLS signature scheme gives you some savings, um, and obviously all the other things that, that reduce the layer two transaction cost um, will open up the applications towards uh, yeah, microfinance in developing economies. So this is where we are now. We're live on Arbitrum Nitro Yoli testnet, and we're going to be deploying to Arbitrum and Optimism after some order fixes and other um, layer twos that are EVM um, compatible or equivalent. We'll seek to do wallet, um, basically get this into wallets uh, currently and to encourage dApps to use it. So we'll first target applications where this will have a direct benefit to help, help uh, sort of priced out users. And um, of course, support uh, regular Web3 wallets with integration via 4337, because that seems to be where the attention is um, with wallets. And further optimization will just be ongoing. We'll look to do those um, other opt optimizations um, to make transactions cheaper uh, for the wallets that already have it integrated. And of course, things just get even better when, when uh, 4844 drops. So this is how it feels to me, that we've got, on the one hand, a lot of real-world problems that kind of are cut out from the Web3 solutions due to the cost per transaction. But um, we hope that we, so once that joins in, that we will get these real-world problems being solved by Web3 solutions. And uh, yeah, we just sort of are looking forward to that time, because I think that's when we'll get, again, a resurgence of 
uh, a lot of activity, we'll have a lot of users, we'll actually be able to benefit from the, the primitives that we're building, that everyone's building in, in the community. So this is us, we're web, um, BLS Wallet. If you want to learn more, um, check it out in browser demo. Um, it's at bluswallet.org. Maybe don't hit it all at once in case it crashes, but it'll be fine. Um, check it out GitHub. There's a Discord, Web3Well. And um, yeah, are there any questions? Okay. <laughs> uh, just a uh, question, yeah. Okay. Um, again, uh, congratulations for the project. It's, very, it's going to be very useful to the community. Uh, my question is, um, when you create the wallet and make this, these changes you were proposing, that is great, you need also to update the clients. Because, for instance, to support the multiple uh, transactions, you want to sign it, it's an amazing idea. Um, are you talking to the, I don't know, with uh, execution layer clients to help them to yeah. adapt their clients? Yeah. Uh, how, how are how are being the, those conversations? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, quite a while ago, we, we started that um, journey. We started contacting, I think it was even end of last year, started contacting some wallets just to see which ones might be interested, how to begin that conversation. And so it's a very good question. Um, we had some interest from wallets. Certain wallets are saying, yes, we, we want to do this. It's quite interesting. But with what we had, it, it just seemed to not get integrated. So there was a bit of a delay, I think, from wallets, but we were also not live yet. So I think once we're live, that will be helpful. Um, when 4337 came about, the, which is the on-chain account abstraction, um, there was a lot of conversation and interest around that standard, and so maybe the wallets will integrate that standard sooner, and then we can have those conversations again and to say, look, here is an implementation, and these are the features of this one, and I'm sure there'll be other implementations for other signature schemes. So there will be a change on the wallet side, so that they have to sign with a different signature scheme, and then um, obviously in the UI and all that. Uh, apart from the Quill extension, which is the um, basically a reference um, browser wallet. Um, we've also gone through a, a large design, um, I guess, um, yeah, a large design, a set of design and, and um, to look at what future wallets can look like. So these can form a bit of a, um, a you know, a bit of design help for wallets as well. Um, oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. With the clients like Geth or Nimbus, okay. are you talking to those teams? Yeah. Uh, so, so, the, so no, no, that's okay. No, the diagram maybe shows it better. Um, well, this is a bit slow. Yeah, so, so the, the nodes don't need to change. So, so the clients, the, uh, the, um, say the aggregators, there we go, uh, this one. So at the moment, we have a dedicated server that will do the bundling. We've already had conversations with um, well, one particular um, layer two about this to say, that they would want to integrate this. Um, so for us, that's been not been the barrier. We've, we've heard great enthusiasm from um, the layer two networks to say, as soon as wallets are doing this, they're going to put it in. Like the nodes have a vested interest to reduce their costs. So, so that, like for us, that's been a like that was. I did an early litmus test in a sense to talk to them, and they're like, if this is in the wallets, we'll put it in the next day almost. Like that was the, the signal I got from them. But as it stands, this is one solution. Um, the 4337 solution is a little different because I think it's an alternative mempool. Um, but yeah, you can maybe check out their talk for more information on that. We've got a couple of questions over, oh, sorry, over here, yep. Hey, Jesse from Coinbase. Um, two questions, one is if we're exploring kind of EIP3 uh, 4337, is there anything specific we should be keeping in mind with BLS, BLS to make sure that there's like compatibility there just on the Coinbase side? And then the second question is, how does the atomicity actually work in the user operation transactions? Um, how is that actually implemented and like executed on the actual yeah. Uh, layer? Yeah, there. Um, I can cover for the BLS signatures. Um, both the, the current, I think it's F infiltrism is the repo, um, and our wallet under the covers are using the same BLS verification and solidity, and also the same client library. So they should be largely compatible um, for that. Yeah, and, and re yeah, regarding the what's required um, on your side, it would just be the signing, like the client side would just need to sign the BLS um, signature um, for that part. And then uh, depending on which way you go, directly or via 4337, it would just be interacting with the contract wallets that it deploys. Uh, the second question, sorry, what was the second one again? The, oh yeah, sorry, that's right. So for the multi-actions, we have a set of, um, it, it's basically uh, an array of actions inside a user operation. And, and I think 4.3.7 has done the same thing. It's, it's the same format um, that you can specify a set of actions. I use a, um, a uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a cascaded function so that I can call a try on one of them. 
And so if one of the actions fails, then it reverts. And then so all of them revert within that um, try. And then I catch, and then I go into the next user operation. So each user operation is in a loop. And within there, it calls the set of actions to the wallet. And if one of the actions fails, only the user operation is reverted, not the rest of it, because of the try catch, which is nice that Solidity has that now. Yep. Um, who do you anticipate running these aggregated proxies? We hope that it gets merged into the nodes, into the layer two nodes. Yeah, to, to start out, um, we would expect like a dApp would probably run its own aggregator proxy just to kind of like bootstrap the process. Eventually, um, it could potentially be like a, a larger swath of say like nodes having compatibility with that. We also think that um, if we're able to kind of move more towards that like contract funding for the gas, that will make it so it does not matter kind of where you submit it. When it eventually is executed on chain, um, that's when the actual like payment subsidization will happen, and so then it's less important. But to, just to start out, we're having that kind of more like centralized service to just kind of get things going. Thanks for this uh, presentation. Appreciate it. Does Quilt have any sort of priority on uh, test automation for end-to-end -end testing, um, you know, usability testing? Mm. It seems like wallets right now don't pay very much attention to the user yeah. experience. Yeah, good what question. Are, what are users seeing? What are they clicking on? Yeah, no, definitely. That's a very good question. So firstly, the Quill isn't, um, we don't want to release Quill as a wallet. It's meant to be like a reference implementation to show how other wallets can integrate the client. Um, we had considered spending more effort um, making the UI match the designs that have come about. So the designs we have are there. So if you go to our uh, Discord, I think in, in the design channel, we have a link to the design um, brief that was done. Or does it, Oh, I forget what we call it as, an, as a whole, but um, there's just been a, a large design process done to look at what wallets of the future can look like, multi-chain, uh, multi-wallet, and all of that being very usable. So we've done that as more of an exercise to say, this is what wallets can do. But again, we had considered putting that into Quill, but because we don't want to necessarily launch it, we leave them there as reference implementations. Quill being the technical one and the design uh, being for other wallets to learn from if, if that's a value. So there was some user research done with that as well. And, and yeah. I think we still have some time for questions. We've got another. Yep, we've got a question up the front. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Um, uh, I'm just learning about BLS, uh, so <laughs> don't mind if my question is too naive. But with uh, developments like ZK EVM on layer twos, um, for signature aggregations uh, and atomicity, like I can basically do, like as you showed, like approve and then transfer like a bunch of things. What do you think about like recursive proofs? Mm. Uh, so if I've uh, I, I have like multiple transactions. I have each proof and I take them and just submit recursive proofs. Uh, so in that case, how like how do we think about developments in ZK EVM and BLS going to get going to play? Yeah, I think um, and you might have a, some thoughts on this too, James. Um, I think we haven't really fully looked into what it's going to look like, but we think um, this wallet BLS wallet ecosystem would work in any EVM compatible system. And so we might be able to even reduce some of the data that needs to be proved or run over in those ZK EVM setups. But I, we haven't done a ton of experimentation yet to see that, I think. But there is the possibility that it will help. I think that's our time. That's our time. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you so much for that. Next up is a talk by Patrick who claims to be an intern at Infura and in the past has been an assistant professor at many universities. Uh, please welcome Patrick for his talk on validating bridges, rollups, and plasmas. 